Take one. Welcome back to the show. We're about to learn the secret sauce. Jeff, what's up? How's it going? Cool. So you are actually, I don't even know what your actual title, uh, title co-founder of Chroma. <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, that works. Excellent. So Chroma is a thing that we're going to get into, but let's start with like who Jeff is. Yeah, sure. So my name is Jeff. Um, let's see. I've spent a bunch of time in the Bay Area growing up. Um, spent a good number of years in North Carolina growing up. Okay. Is that where um, you're originally from? I was born in the peninsula. Okay. When I was young, moved out to North Carolina, did like grade school, middle school, high school, college. Uh, yeah, were your parents doing the tech in the RTP or something like that? Yeah, my dad actually had um, gone to Berkeley for his MBA and then worked at HP for a bit and then okay. went to IBM. There was like a giant like IBM yeah. campus um, yep. in the triangle at that time. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So what's, what's Chroma? What are you working on right now? Yeah, so Chroma is an open source vector database. And our goal is to give uh, developers the ability to create programmable memory for AI. And when I say programmable memory, what I mean is um, language models are really powerful, obviously, but we want to be able to bring language models into our applications and our user experiences and our internal processes. And we want to make them really reliable systems um, that do what they're supposed to do every time, you know, even when the real world throws kind of you know, messy information at them. Yeah. And so um, the way to do that is to give the language model more information than it knows about in its own weights. So the language model's seeing a bunch of stuff on the internet, but doesn't necessarily know about your company's data. And so a vector database is the bridge between the information about your team, your tools, your data, and makes that accessible to the language model so that it can make the best decision possible um, at, at prompt time. Yeah, and the, I, I, I've known that you've been working on this for a little bit, uh, the last 14 months. And you kind of, you were like pre kind of a huge wave that we're seeing right now in AI. So like we, we are coming out of like this AI agent craze and everyone's like raising money. But now there's like a, a sense of you have to build a thing that builds a thing underneath. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about like, the origin of Chroma, like how you sort of like started working on this problem, why you started working on this problem, uh, and how you got to this solution? Yeah. Um, so Chroma uh, started about 18 months or so ago. So my co-founder Anton and I started just chatting about our experiences as engineers. Um, we had both spent quite a bit of time doing applied uh, machine learning, we call it applied AI. So building models and putting them out into the real world and then seeing how they get mugged by reality and then trying to figure out how to improve them so that they're more robust. And you know that, that cycle, that feedback loop is incredibly painful to this day. Yeah. Um, there's basically almost no tools, extremely little tooling to figure out, okay, here's my model. It's you know hitting 80% today. We have to get to 95% in order to have it really be a useful tool. How do we get, how do we cross the bridge of that 15%? Just throw more data at it and let's hope, you know, hope and pray that it gets a little bit better. Yeah. And so I think that that, that feedback loop we had just seen and felt so viscerally and so painfully ourselves and we wanted to cross that gap. So there's the gap between broadly when you use anything with AI, the gap between a sexy demo and a robust production system. Um, and it's, it's a tough gap. So that was the core pain point that we connected over and started talking about. And then um, in my previous role, I had started to build out a bunch of developer tools around AI, computer vision, machine learning. Um, we were open sourcing some things and I just felt like um, open source was awesome. And I wanted to build an open source community. I wanted to build an open source commercial project. Um, and so, you know, that was something that was like true from the very earliest days was whatever we do, it's going to be open source. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll figure out everything else later. Yeah, that's amazing too as well. And like, I, I've i always been adjacent to the ML space and like never really sort of dug in, but I was very aware of the struggles of getting started and like the GPUs and like getting hands on things to have enough power to then get data into it and then train it mm -hmm. and then only being not even halfway there to having something usable. Uh, actually, at GitHub, I had a colleague who because we got acquired by Microsoft, we had free Azure compute. So my colleague, he uh, basically just got used his GPU credits to then build a, a language, uh, not even a language model, but like to build some ML to then look at Octocats 
and like sort of like is this a hot dog type of deal yeah uh, this built that for octocats and okay he spent like six months like finding all the sort of taking pictures on his phone and then sending it to the model yep. um and it was like it was cool but like it was a lot of work for i don't know where that went it was just like a little side project to spend compute because we had it yep but yep. yeah the barrier of entry of getting the ai has completely shifted like the thanks to I, I don't know if it's thanks to OpenAI. I'm happy to get pushed back on that, but they have provided enough tooling that people can grasp like what they can do with it now. So now we have the influx yeah. of a bunch of startups on top of, right. frankly, OpenAI. I mean, when we got started, um, you know, there was, there was no stable diffusion yet. Yeah. Um, GPT-3 was like technically out, but nobody really knew what you could do with it. Um, you know, ChatGPT came out last November. Um, and, you know, I think there, there's a phase change from before you had to build an ML model to do a specific thing. Yeah. So it was like, is this tweet mean or not? Um, you know, is this photo of a bird or a dog or a cat? Um, where, how many, you know, put a bounding box around the cars in this photo, right? And um, it was, a again, it was a huge lift. It was quite difficult to build these models. And then if you built them, they'd only do one thing. Yeah, and then uh, there's this phase change now to where we have general purpose models, um, and you know these general purpose models can do a lot of things out of the box, and so you know all of a sudden what before was only the the domain of AI experts became in really a very short time you know the domain of application developers who truly in a weekend can pick up some of these tools plug them together and deliver some pretty meaningful, new and powerful user experiences. Um, so it's pretty, super cool. Yeah. And so like the trend we're seeing right now is we're, again, building the thing that builds the thing. Uh, so now we have things like Chroma where, correct me if I'm wrong, I could build my own chat GPT with my own data pretty quickly with the tool like Chroma, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think as a developer, you can pick up the GPT-4 API, you could pick up Chroma, and then you could pick up a bunch of documents you have. It could be a common one that people start with is like their support knowledge base, or it could be a bunch of Wikipedia information or their private notes. And probably in two hours, you can have a chat experience where you can ask questions, you know, you do natural language Q&A, just like you would in ChatGPT, over those documents. Um, but it knows about your data. Yeah. And so you can say, hey, what is my company's return policy? And it'll be able to retrieve the relevant information and use that in answering your question so it doesn't just make up or hallucinate an answer. Um, and uh, that's a pretty useful thing, obviously. Yeah, extremely useful. I think on the on my Uber ride over, uh, we have uh, Becca, who's at our at Open Source, writing a bunch of content around open source and getting started. Uh, and she was actually had the, the problem because she's written like, I don't know, like 40 plus articles uh, since she joined in May. Uh, which is absolutely amazing. Shout out to Becca. Uh, <laughs> nice. But now she's got the issue of like, oh, have I said this before yet? Or mm. where did I reference this in another place? Right. Uh, and because it's all on the web, um, you could open up like, you know, the local uh, markdown files and you can like, get, pull it up in VS Code and be like, oh, let me just command find to see if I mention this string of words. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it doesn't work when like you use different phrases or tone. So I was like, oh, you should just like, vector databases thing and like start <laughs> start searching uh for stuff you've done before and even like generating new posts based on the right. existing post because that's what we're doing right now we're going to remix a lot of the posts we've done on like dev put it on our blog mm -hmm. for like some of the the, the number one hits are uh, the stuff that gets a lot of traction yep and then attach that to like a feature so then our blog talk, like leads in our features where the community stuff is like not feature focused um mm -hmm. yeah so anyway this the world is like yeah. amazing at this point yeah, I mean, the obviously the language models are really powerful, really useful. I think also it's worth mentioning that in just the past, you know, couple of years as well, embedding models have gotten to the point where they are also general purpose, yeah, and and quite good. And so, you know, what embedding models are trained on is semantic similarity, and so they're trained to put similar content close to each other in this like higher dimensional embedding space. And what that allows as a developer is this ability to do fuzzy search. Yeah. So instead of having to search by an explicit string or, you know, variants of this explicit string like you would with text search, you can say, hey, where did I talk about that thing where, you know, that developer was like having trouble with something? Yeah. And 
the vibe, if you will, will be embedded. And then you'll do like vibe search and you'll find yeah. that you'll find the documents that yeah. uh, that share that vibe, that share that semantic similarity. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and that's pretty cool, too. Yeah. And it's the term that uh, when I was doing all my research to build the thing that we're building right now, like semantic search is the like it gets attached to vector databases. Yeah. Is that like the term that people would probably be looking for if they're if they want to build something like this? Yeah, I think the exact terms haven't landed. There's yeah. retrieval, vector search, vector retrieval, semantic okay. similarity, semantic similarity search. I mean, I could keep going. There's like a ton of them. Yeah. Um, you know, the macro term that we really care about and we've been thinking about is this idea of AI memory. Yeah. And so again, the, the oh, question yeah. becomes, you know, if uh Becca asks, Hey, where did I talk about this thing? Um, how how should that search process be constructed? such that we find all the relevant information that possibly the language model would need to know about yeah and then put that in the context window so the language model can see it and then use it yeah and so in some cases that's going to be semantic similarity powered by embeddings in other cases it might be you know hey okay becca mentioned like twilio the search for stuff related to twilio too yeah. because maybe that's what she wants to know about and so yeah. i think there's maybe this you know the broad goal here would be to again create programmable memory for ai um, and vector search is a really powerful tool in the toolbox. Yeah, and there's a, there's a current conversation that literally, honestly, I think we have the conversation to close now of like the death of Stack Overflow. I don't know if you saw those tweets yeah. uh, from Nat mm -hmm. um, literally this week. Yeah, um, I think that was kind of going the bat of like there was a different situation for Stack Overflow and why the downturn. It wasn't specifically yeah. AI. Yeah, I saw that too. Uh, but then in that same vein, so like the the first tweet was like, oh, look at the trend. ChatGPT killed Stack Overflow. Um, not so much the case when you sort of dig into it, but then at the end of the week was like yesterday or the day before, uh, what was it, AI overflow or I don't know what they called it, but Stack Overflow shipped their, their yeah. GPTV like like experience. Yeah, yeah, that, I saw that too. Yeah, so like now we're seeing a trend of like the incumbents of like all these, I was gonna call them startups, like Stack yeah. Overflow is no longer a startup, but yeah. basically all these companies are now applying AI as part of their feature suite, uh, which is like, Mind blowing. So, like going back to like Becca's example, like if we were only writing on Hashnode or Dev.2, the world probably looks like Hashnode and Dev.2 also have their their vector DB to then have the question of like, I want to find all uh, what it whisper mm -hmm. generated posts um, to be able to find out more details of ex examples in this. And like, not everyone puts on hashtags, and you can't sh sort of like find the thing you're looking for. Yeah, is every company going to have their search experience now powered by vector? Let's see a few questions that kind of packaged in there. So one question would be about like data licensing. Yeah. And with the advent of, of AI models, uh, large corpuses of data just became way more valuable. Yeah. Um, and we'll let the the courts decide about, you know, who and should be allowed to use what. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> I-A-N-A-L, right? Um, I think that the other question mark here is around, like, will there be, you know, one chat interface to rule them all? Like, or will we still go to you know distinct web properties and then interact with a custom experience that, that web property has has given to us? Maybe a simple example here would be flight search. You know, well, five years from now, what percentage of flight search will be done through the ChatGPT interface versus what percentage of flight search will still be on Kayak um, or elsewhere? And yeah. that's that's one simple way to kind of uh, hone the question and. Um, I think there was a moment in time earlier this year where, you know, it se certainly either seemed like or the, the, the feeling was maybe that, you know, so much of the web's traffic would coalesce to this one magical box, kind of in the way that, oh, maybe that Google did before, you know? And um, it feels like the jury's out on that. Again, I think that I'm, I'm not going to... Predictions of this time scale are the, the Death Valley of predictions. <laughs> yes. You're always wrong. So I won't hazard a prediction, but, um, you know, it doesn't seem as obvious. It doesn't seem like, for example you know, ChatGPT plugins have quite found product market fit. Now, that could be, you know, one small tweak away, as you know, with these things, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to overstate how far off they are. It could be yeah. one small change. Um, but again, yeah, it's kind of an open question. And I think that like, I still think that, you know, people with passion and dedication will be able to create better experiences for end users. And then if those experiences are even 10 or 20% better, than like the mainline experience yeah. and users have the muscle memory of going to their URL bar and typing yeah. K A and then it <laughs> auto completes kayak and they click enter. Yeah. Then I think that like users will still do that. Yeah. So if I had to hazard a guess, I would guess that we would see basically a multipolar world 
yeah. when it comes to you know AI experiences interfaces. I think also one other comment, it's not really obvious that chat either can or should be the final UI for yeah. for frankly anything. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like it is pretty magical in some ways, um, but it also has a ton of downsides. And um, there are a lot of really interesting, you know, formal researchers and also, you know, Twitter researchers, which I don't mean as a as a as an insult. It's actually a compliment yeah. who are doing, I think, really incredible, interesting, groundbreaking work around like AI user experiences, gen yeah. generative UI, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So we'll see how all that shakes out. Yeah, and like our, our our first AI feature we shipped inside of open source was just take a PR generated description. Mm -hmm. So as trivially as, as it gets, uh, like we centralize around that to learn as a team to like, okay, this is how we can interact with this new ecosystem. Yep. Uh, so I'm 100% with you. Like there's things we can do more at AI and sort of extract and like there's maybe a different interface where we sort of apply like pattern matching, like when when a VC looks at your your company and your project, they're like, oh yeah, does it fit the bill? Or looks at the founder, does it fit the bill? Mm -hmm. uh, but I actually want to take a step back because the other thing I wanted to I, I wanted to mention is the not even mention ask. I don't know if you see like Elasticsearch as like a competitor because mm -hmm. like when I think of like okay, all my data in one place, and I know GitHub spent a couple years yeah. rebuilding search yeah they did on top of Elastic, uh, and it, it mostly works today. Uh, and I because I spent all that time like I'm a power search user on GitHub yeah. But not everyone else is. So, is there a world where like even Elastic sort of gets their their lunch eaten? It's a good question. Um, again, I would wouldn't necessarily ha get too too spicy, <laughs> but hazarding guesses about you know other other companies. Um, you know, I think for us, we feel like vectors and latent space more broadly. Yeah. Obviously, a vector represents a point in latent space. Yeah, this higher dimensional. Like space? quick side note, yeah. I looked up what latent space meant because the podcast. Oh uh, yeah, we shot at Alessio, and I'm like, I should probably look up what this means. Yeah, because I keep hearing it in the podcast. So like on episode twenty at this point. Right. Finally looked it up. It's a genius name for a podcast for sure. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we for the audience, we humans live in sort of primarily three dimensional space. We reason in three dimensions. Obviously, time is the fourth dimension. Yeah. Um, and then you know, if you get back an embedding from OpenAI, I think it's fifteen thirty six dimensions. So, what does it mean for something to be in 1536 dimensions? Um, it's a point in you know higher dimensional space, um, and so I think like you know for Chroma specifically, we feel like what's really amazing about latent space is you're basically taking data and you're hoisting it into the brain of the model, and that point represents how the model understands that piece of data. And what's interesting about it is that it is still a map; it is a geometric data structure, and we think there's a lot of meaning and information and in how the points relate to one another. Um, and a lot of meaning and information, in, you know, where points are far apart or where there's holes yeah. in the embedding space or the latent space. Um, and so where there's no information at all. And so, you know, these kinds of questions, I think that we are really obsessed by, and, you know, we will uniquely build a system, just answer these kinds of questions. And so, you know, everybody wants to have, you know, maybe this like take about all oh, search will be eaten by vector search. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, all databases will be eaten by vector databases. Again, also not true. It doesn't tend to be the case that like, you know, previous technologies get totally wiped out. I yeah. mean, even like your classic horse and car dichotomy, right? Like, okay, yeah. maybe that's an extreme case because it is primarily a, a, a car's game these days, right? Yeah. But uh, but horses are still around. Um, so yeah, I think that like the right tool for the job, you know, is always a uh, it's always an important question. Yeah, I, I went through this a couple years ago with GraphQL versus REST, and I think everyone's kind of like pick their position in that sort of space. I think that's still being figured out, but right. at the end of the day, like rest is always the tried and true thing that at least I keep going back to rest, even though I love GraphQL, but yeah. there's certain situations like where GraphQL is just not needed. It's just more of a complexity. Yeah, I think, I think with GraphQL and rest is like, you know, my, you play another story much better than I do, yeah. but you know, it kind of seems like GraphQL was meant for a very specific use case, yeah. which was minimizing the data footprint of data over the wire for latency limited mobile experiences. Yeah. And then pretty much it, yeah. All of a sudden, people were like, "Oh, this makes my life easier as an application developer for doing web apps where you're not really latency bound." And um, as you know, like just all kinds of it was just it was sort of it was aggressively adopted too fast. So I guess my macro point here is I don't know that GraphQL was really ten times better at anything, yeah, than REST is today. Or just an HTTP interfaces today. Yeah. Um, and I think it is true that vector search is ten times better at things that a last, you know, elastic or classic text search. Yeah. Uh, than it does today. So maybe that 
my argument would be that these are these two interactions are sort of apples and oranges. Yeah. But, yeah. So then my question would be, I'm a CTO or I'm just an engineer starting a new project or existing project rather. I've got a Postgres database. I know I want to advance my feature suite through perhaps having a vector database. Yeah. Is there a world where my main database and my vector database live as siblings or mm -hmm. is there like a sort of parent child relationship when yeah. it comes to vectors? Yeah, I think it depends on the use case. So a lot of data that we're seeing that it's being loaded into vector databases are not currently in relational databases. Yeah. It's textual information, it's images, uh, you know, long form text, not like someone's first name, last name, like yeah. first name, last name make zero sense to embed. You should not embed first name, last name, um, <laughs> <No>, <laughs> semantic similarity for Brian. It's like, okay, I guess that means something, but nothing useful. Yeah. Um, semantic similarity for like long form text or images or these sorts of things. Uh, so, you know, soon video and other modalities, again, things that are not already in a relational database. I think that's the, that's the first point. Um, you know, the second point is that like, you know, there's, there's, it depends on what you're trying to do, whether you need the right tool for the job. You know, you can use a hammer to do a lot of things that a hammer wasn't designed for. Sometimes you can get away with this and then you don't get away with it. Um, you know, there's already a large, uh, there's already a lot of evidence around people using tools like Elastic for text search alongside existing relational databases um, because they're just better at different things. Yeah. And like, I think that the same path will likely exist here. Um, and we can do more like technical algorithms level of like, uh, why and where and, you know, what kinds of resource contention we're concerned about, et cetera. But yeah. I think the macro point is that, again, you know, systems that are designed to do one thing very well end up doing it extremely well uh, relative to the systems that are designed to do everything pretty well. Um, and, you know, you can't have it all. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think we'll probably figure out the space that each of these tools fit in with the sort of modern tech stack. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to more use cases for like a, a vector DB and like Chroma itself. Like, what are mm -hmm. you seeing? Because you're seeing lots of folks leveraging yeah. Chroma today. So, like, what are the use cases that we're seeing outside of just ChatGPT? I mean, the primary the primary use case again is this use case that sort of the industry term of art is retrieval augmented generation. Okay. So you retrieve data to make better the output of the model. Yeah. Um, and I think that another way of thinking about that again is, in a sense, you are programming the model. You're providing data that changes yeah. the execution path of that model's output. So that's the primary use case today. And it's kind of, again, the chat your data use case. Um, you know, we like to say that this is the newspapers on the internet use case. You know, we are already kind of doing it. Uh, it's kind of an obvious thing to do. Um, but it's also very valuable and it should be done. You know, yeah. all newspapers are now on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, uh, you know, maybe there's still some print publications floating around, <laughs> yeah. but, yeah, well, you know. Yeah, some newspapers, <laughs> newspapers didn't survive the, the transition, but yeah, they're yeah. newspapers you can, you can sort of search and find. Yeah. So, so, so RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation, I think, uh, whilst, quote, easy, also probably makes sense over almost any textual corpus of documents, makes sense to exist. Yeah. Um, so that's the first comment. The second use case that we're starting to see emerge, and I think, again, we, we feel like we are extremely early here. I mean, we live in a bubble kind of here in San Francisco, and this is all that anybody talks about. Um, but, you know, we went to a hackathon even just a week or two ago, and it was a hackathon of like an AI company. We thought, oh, most, this will be kind of more bubble, whatever. And people were coming up to us and saying like, so what, is, what does this technology do and, and why would I use it? And it kind of like made us step back and reconsider, you know, from either okay, maybe we're in the first 1% of this to, no, maybe we're like, this is the first 0.1% of this. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, probably true. It's like just extremely, extremely early. Um, and so, you know, all the use cases, all the native use cases, so the use cases that could not be done before, those use cases are obviously really exciting because they could not be done before. Um, you could kind of do text search over documents before. You could kind of build a chat out before. It wasn't as easy. It wasn't as good, but you could still kind of do it. What are the use cases that could not be done before? And I think that the one that like people are right that agents are do matter. So this idea of like this little entity, this little intelligence, which you can uh, give instructions to, you can give feedback to, it learns by watching what you're doing. You know, hopefully mostly it runs on your computer, so it's not too creepy or or Orwellian. Um, but that idea of like a little agent. Uh, I think is pretty attractive because what it enables is like the personalization, the intelligent personalization of certainly any digital product you interact with and then later probably any physical product you interact with. And so a very kind of trivial example of this, I'll give you two. So one would be like, you know, a little agent that sits over your email inbox 
and you yeah. want to just give it feedback. Hey, like next time I get a calendaring invite from somebody at a sales company, archive the email. You know, yeah. hey, next time I get uh, an, an uh, email from like an investor, you know, like market for the weekend. Yeah. Um, like, and you want to be able to give that natural language instruction and then have it respected and have it executed. And yeah. you also want to give it feedback. Hey, please don't do that again, you know? Yeah. And have it respected. So that's one. I think another more physical use case is like, you know, again, this is your classic like talking to your washing machine thing. Yeah. Like, should we be able to talk to our washing machines or our dishwashers? I don't know. Like, it's, it seems like, you know, the Jetsons, it kind of just seems trivial. Um, but I think there is something to it where you can say, you know, say to your washing machine, again, give it like natural language instructions to have it do what you want it to do next time. And you experience yeah. this all the time with products, digital or physical, where it just doesn't do quite what you want it to do. Yeah. Oh, well, we but saw this get... with the Echo devices and like yeah. it could do the thing if it was like trained to do the thing already, but you couldn't train it. Exactly. So that ability to teach and, you know, yeah. and the ability to teach the model something and then for it to remember it, um, I think unlocks a lot of really exciting use cases. So, um, so that's, that's, you know, one bucket. And then the third bucket is like, you've maybe seen some experiments online with like agent to agent interactions, people yeah. creating like virtual worlds and having agents to all create kinds of crazy interactions and stuff. Um, I think yet yeah, we're still early in figuring out where the utility is on that. Yeah. Um, but this agent to human interaction stuff, again, it's like maybe like it's kind of like the, the movie Her. Maybe people think that's scary or bad. I think in reality, it'll be a lot more boring yeah, and I, just useful. So. It, I'd be more scared if it was the movie Megan instead. I, I haven't seen it. That. I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, so. that's okay. It's like her with the physical represent. It's pretty, it's wild. I'll check it out. Uh, I, th I think about that movie a lot. No, okay, I'll be honest. So, yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe space it out there. But yeah, I, I the, yeah, I was just, I mentioned like the Echo devices because I feel like they, they missed, they missed an opportunity. Like there was a time where everyone thought we wanted to talk to devices. Right. But now we're in a world where everyone thinks we want to chat to devices. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I could basically say, hey, you know, I eat a baked potato and uh, a, a piece of chicken breast every day. Like, that's my model. Now, what can I do outside of that model? Um, it's like, maybe that's rudimentary, but like, I, I look forward to the world where I can basically pattern match my life uh, yep. through in, in memory models and stuff like that. Yeah, I think a lot of the like technology waves of the past, whether it be things like augmented reality or maybe more like VR. Uh, whether it be certainly sort of like chat interfaces, in-home speakers, yeah. uh, smart home before that. Um, I think a lot of them were directionally correct and good ideas, but the timing was wrong. Yeah. And I think that it is quite likely that either now or, you know, at least two years or three years from now, um, all the base technology will be readily available to really make those useful magical experiences and not frustrating ones. Anybody who's interacted with smart home technology will tell you, no, just get the light switches. You know, yeah. you know, you don't want to have it to be very fancy. Yeah. Um, but I think that now we can have our have our cake and eat it too. It can both be simple and yeah. powerful. So yeah. So I I, I want to your co-founder worked at Facebook previously, or, or I guess Meta now. Mm -hmm. uh, Meta launched their Llama two thing. Um, Microsoft is invested in Llama two, or not even invested in Llama two. They're participating in yeah. all these other different models. Yep. So do we see an acceleration? even more so that now we have all these incumbents now participating and providing co like free computer discounted compute. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the, the real question there behind that question is like, what do we see next? Yeah. It's a good question. There's a lot of different ways it could go. You know, any of these are speculative at best. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that you should expect to see the community pick up open source commercially friendly models like Llama 2 and really squeeze all the juice out of them. Um, that means making them easy to fine tune, means getting structured outputs out of them that's already happened. Um, you know, I think that the, the the idea of a general purpose reasoning machine, which is outside of the idea of maybe artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence, but just like general purpose reasoning black box yeah, um, is incredibly exciting. And I think that uh, model distillation will be important. So the idea is like, can we take large models that have memorized large corpuses of the internet or pseudo memorize these things and maybe have some emerged capabilities in terms of their reasoning power? Can we distill out of those large models, small models that maintain all the reasoning power, but minimize the bias towards hallucinations or to like make stuff up? Um, because you've sort of wiped out the weights that were, you know, memorization focused. 
I think, again, if you're an AI researcher, this is not the, exactly what's happening under the hood. Yeah. But this idea of distilling out reasoning capability is quite exciting. So distillation is really important as well. Small models. Small models have the benefit, too, of being cheaper to train, cheaper to run, um, maybe, easy, maybe even having better interpretability as well, which interpretability is always a big deal. Um, I think another another bucket of like really interesting things happening is uh, multimodal models. Um, so you saw earlier this year with the GPT-4 Vision demo, yeah. the ability to plug in a picture and understand the real world. And I think that that ability, you know, it'll be the first version and it'll get much better very quickly. Um, that ability will likely bring intelligence more into real world contexts in a way that it never has really before. And I think actually there was an announcement from Google, uh, like DeepMind, Google Robotics, even just today or yesterday on a, on a similar note. It was sort of like a, a vision language transformer model. Um, again, that kind of can bring, may, may actually, anou- I mean, planning, uh, sensing, sensing and planning, sensing recognition and planning are the biggest problems in robotics, largely. Yeah. Um, there's also a bunch of other, you know, sure, like batteries and motor stuff, but um, those might be not solved, but get much better in very short order. So multimodal is really exciting. Robotics is really exciting. Small models is really exciting. I think that we'll continue to see open source continue to like make more and more strides. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me that if we think about the current workloads that go through GPT 3.5, GPT 4 today, um, or Claude 2 or Palm or whatever, um, it wouldn't surprise me if we see as good performance from open source models in the next year. Yeah. Um, you know, that being said, people always want the the latest and greatest. The latest and greatest will be always a little bit more reliable. It'll be a little bit, a little bit or a lot more powerful. Um, and then there's also this question of like, well, there are economies of scale. And if you're running 100,000 GPUs or more, um, you know, maybe you can actually run these things cheaper than you can even run the open source model yourself. Yeah. And so I think that's another interesting cost curve that people don't talk about enough. Um, but yeah. it is a real one. Yeah. yeah. It's a, yeah, it, it's a fascinating time too as well. And I, now we have the, um, I guess, uh, they were talking about like GTP four and like even like GTP five whatever that comes out, like the danger of that. Now we have like the federal government now Mm -hmm. creating this sort of cohort of folks to, for safety and AI. Yeah. What's your take on that? And like that speed of acceleration, but also are we going to hit a ceiling of governance, literally like figurative governance in a term that could be both ways. Yeah. I think that um, it's not obvious to me that the current trajectory leads to, uh, you know, a singular intelligence, which is smarter than all of humanity combined. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that people, you know, pe- humans are not good at thinking in exponentials, but humans are also not good at thinking in, in S curves. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this is like true about COVID, for example. Um, you know, it was true about, you know, take, take any sort of like mass market meme or like panic over the last like five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, it's usually an exponential event that uh, people have adjusted to to some degree. And, you know, you see these like tweets on Twitter about if, you know, one person spreads it to three people, then 100 billion people will have it next week. You know, yeah. it's like early in COVID. And of course, there's not 100 billion people in the world. Um, and uh, I think that to some degree, that's what's happening, you know, now as well. Or another another joke here is that if you look at like historically, you know, there was the famous figure of Malthus who predicted that the world would run out of food and there'd be mass famines. And then the irony is that if you look at the data, Malthus was right every single year up until Malthus like published his book. And then there were uh, innovations in like yeah. you know, chemistry and, and uh, biology that meant that that was no longer true. Yeah. Um, and we were able to really get to like mass mass farming. So um, yeah, the, the P doom stuff, which is like AI will, it's by itself, you know, take over and kill all of humanity. I think is uh, kind of just a deus ex machina. It's a secular apocalypse. Um, it's probably rooted in the fact that, like, you know, modern society has, you know, rid itself of a lot of religion. But, you know, human beings being human beings being religiously minded, um, you know, pick up worse religions. Yeah. Um, this is certainly one of them. Um, so that's one comment. I think the second comment is around um, the, the likelihood that bad humans use this technology for evil. Yeah. So it's not that the AI itself is going to take over, take it over, take over the world, but maybe a bad human picks it up and does something evil with it. I think most of the sophisticated people will tell you that that is a much more real and present danger. Um, you know, and you see these graphs in the New York Times where they compare language models to nuclear bombs, which are probably this came out yesterday, which was like kind of ludicrous. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, 
it, we, we don't know. We don't know yet. Yeah. We don't know yet what this kind of technology put into the hands of people that have evil intent, like what it will mean. Yeah. And that we also don't know what the cat and mouse game will look like either. Yeah. You know, there are plenty of bad people out there that have plenty of tools today to do really bad things. Um, yeah. And, you know, bad things do happen. But on the on the net net, people are pretty happy to live in this this millennia versus previous millennia. And so um, my overall bet would be that that trend continues. But yeah, well, speaking of good tools, try dot com. That's your URL. Yeah. T-R-Y Chroma dot com. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, folks, if you're interested in checking out this technology, uh, we have like hundreds of thousands of impressions soon. Like by the time this video is like hits that, it'll be like, of course, we got all those folks. So, like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, thanks for the time uh, chatting about Chroma, and uh, folks, stay saucy. Yeah.